and we are rolling. Hi, this is Mark Goldberg with the UN and Global Affairs blog, speaking with... Michael Collins, human rights reporter of Mother Jones. Excellent. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be speaking with Mac today because uh, we're going to be covering sort of, you know, two broad topics today, Burma and Haiti, both of which are in the news uh, and both of which are places that Mac, you've reported from and I've sort of written about, so I'm really happy and eager to get your perspective on, you know, what, what's happening. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll kick it off with Burma because, you know, as I was saying before, it's sort of rare that, that Burma leads the news, but significant events over this past weekend was the uh, first elections in Burma in something like 20 years. And I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll sort of like kick it off to you to kind of give some background and explain sort of what happened and sort of, you know, all we need to know about, you know, Burma's history in the next, you know, in, in like two minutes or less. Sure. No problem. Um, yeah. The, uh, well, so what happened on Sunday, which is when they had their elections, was what everybody knew was going to happen. They had fixed the race long before it even started. When they announced the election rules, they were grossly unfair. There were really weird campaigning allowances and restrictions. And, of course, there's the censorship that they always have going on, so you can't say anything bad about the government. So all that same sort of stuff that is always happening carried through to this election. And then, uh, in addition, there's a constitution that the junta recently passed, and they had already reserved 25 percent of the seats in the legislature for the military. And then, in addition to that, a bunch of former military stepped down so that they would be able to run as civilians and take up basically the rest of the seats as part of the Union Solidarity and Development Party, which is basically the proxy party of the junta. Surprisingly, uh, the USDP took 80% of the seats. That's what they're claiming. Already, there's a lot of people who are contesting that. There are a lot of people who were saying that they were um, forced to vote or they would be shot. They were paid to vote. They were rounded up and made to go vote. Or they didn't even vote, but their votes have somehow still shown up. And now what we're seeing is that some of the ethnic militias, which have been, you know, sort of skirmishing on the border for decades, sort of blew up on Sunday and they took over a city in Burma, actually, and tens of wow. thousands of people fled into Thailand because the city of Miawati is right on the border with Thailand. And so, I mean, you could throw something from one side to the other. And uh, some, some ethnic militias took government buildings and they just sort of, you know, there was like a, a little coup basically in that town that f made people flee. And now some of the ethnic militias are saying that they are going to band together and uh, take uh, on the Burma army. Really? And what, what are their chances of success? It's seemingly low. Yeah, yeah, you have like a couple thousand guys and some old guns versus, you know, several hundred thousand Burma army troops with brand new Chinese arms. So, yeah, they are probably not going to take over the entire country, but they could cause some serious, serious problems and some serious conflicts along that border area. And, and meanwhile, sort of the, the, the sort of best known Burman, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, it was... was been under house arrest, and she was not able to stand for election. Was her party also banned in advance of, of this election? Yes, they were. So they were the ones who won the election that was 20 years ago, and right. uh, they, you know, they had the regime said that they were not going to recognize those. Re you know, when they lost, they were like, "Those results are fake," and so they just, yeah. you know, would nullify them. So, uh, no, they were not allowed to run in this election either, which, even if they hadn't been officially disbanded, they probably wouldn't have any way. They had already announced that they were going to boycott it because it was a big, fat sham, which it was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you, you, sort of, you, you have a couple of posts that, that um, very uh, succinctly go through the reasons why this was a completely bogus election. And, you know, what, what's, what's interesting is, is sort of this seems to pose – a, um, a, a dilemma, I think, for, for American policy in the region. You know, as, as we're chatting, Obama is, is Indonesia um, and, you know, just came from India and uh, on way to South Korea. Um, and, you know, from, uh, you know, I've, I've read statements from Susan Rice, from John Kerry, you know, and, and, you know, all saying this is a sham and bogus election. And, you know, what's interesting here is, is that, you know, 
Burma uh, for, for U.S. policy was sort of one of the testing grounds of Obama's, you know, idea of engagement. And, you know, he was going to sort of like let up on the harsh rhetoric, was going to, you know, see if, if the administration could encourage this election to go through in, in sort of a, you know, a way that approached international standards. But when that seemed to sort of not be very likely, they, they started ratcheting up the rhetoric. And, you know, one of the ways in which they did that was to, you know, put forward this idea of having some sort of uh, international human rights commission or human rights, you know, special sort of uh, uh, procedure, as it's called in, in the UN, just to have sort of an investigator, international investigator, kind of look into issues. And um, maybe like two weeks ago, Colm Lynch in the uh, Washington Post and for Foreign Policy wrote an article saying, showing how sort of China has systematically blocked the UN from going forward with this idea of, of, of appointing some sort of human rights investigator for Burma. And so, you know, it seems as if the, the you know, the situation is kind of caught between the U.S. and the West on one side, wanting to, you know, ratchet up the rhetoric, wanting to sort of, you know, denounce these elections and, and China and, and sort of other regional actors wanting to kind of embrace this sort of baby step towards democracy. Sure. Um, I mean, that was, you know, if the Obama administration was ever saying, we have hopes that this election is going to be a step forward. I mean, that was always crazy town. And what ended up happening, which is Obama saying, you know, the junta stole the election was what everybody, you know, always knew was going to happen. So, they do have the problem, which is that, you know, we're saying that over here, but in the ASEAN, you know, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, in their newspapers, they're saying, you know, in India and in Thailand and in China, um, you know, great, this is a step forward. So those countries are so economically allied with Burma and dependent on Burma, frankly, at this point. China and India need Burma's energy, and they have vast energy resources in Burma. And so they are going to keep being on that side, and they are going to keep saying, you know, um, everything is fine over here. You know, their business is their business. So they have, have been for years and are actually becoming more of an obstacle because the further away that the West gets from Burma and the, you know, the closer it becomes allied with China, which, you know, their investments there are just getting deeper and deeper as the U.S. is passing more and more sanctions so that, you know, soon we won't have any relationship with them at all and we lose, mm -hmm. you know, all the leverage. We don't really have any now, but we certainly aren't going to have any left. And so we had this, like along these lines, we kind of had this, this exchange um, over Twitter and, and on the blogs um, about, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like naturally disposed to be sort of like a glass half full sort of person. And I read this art, this, this analysis from, from Brookings uh, saying that, you know, th there is some sort of dim possibility of hope that this election, you know, gives you know, Burma, a patina of legitimacy and a patent of, of democracy that Burman, like the, 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 the Burman government will want to sort of show results to their people now in, in a more effective way. And on top of that, um, you know, investments from China and from other neighbors might increase. And the, the article made this sort of argument that, you know, in the region, sort of the, the modus operandi, the, the pathway towards development has been, you know, economic liberalization first, followed by democracy and, and human rights and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the, the argument is that, you know, this kind of is the moment where, if not the U.S., at least uh, Chinese and, and other regional actors will, will, will get in there and, and make some more investments and maybe start along a process of, of you know, economic liberalization and all, and all that. So I don't know, but you took issue with that, and, and so maybe you should explain why. I did. Um, I mean, I want there to be good news about the elections and good news for Burma, too. But the weird thing about that analysis saying that, you know, maybe because it's this ostensible democracy, China's going to pour a bunch of money into it. The weird thing about that is that China has already poured a whole bunch of money into it. I mean, the, the investment, foreign investment in Burma is higher now than it has ever been. So it's not like there's some lack of dollars going into that country. So I'm not really sure, I mean, what the rationale is that, that that's going to make a huge difference. We've already got billions worth of foreign investment in the country. Is any of that trickling down to 
you know, the rest of the population? Is any of that promoting um, any sort of mitigation of these gross human rights abuses that the regime has been perpetrating for decades? It's not. I mean, if anything, what you've seen is that, you know, the level of starvation, the level of poverty, the level of, you know, disease that's completely unchecked, and also the level of atrocities that government soldiers are perpetrating against villagers, all of those things are on the rise, even as this foreign investment has already been on the rise. So that's, I don't, I don't understand, you know, what difference the Chinese dumping a bunch more money into the country is going to make. Nor do I see, you know, much indication that China really cares whether <laughs> or not, you know, the rest of the world thinks that Burma is a democracy before it will give it a bunch of cash and weapons, which it's been doing forever. Well, you've convinced me. <laughs> uh, um, it's funny it's like in, in these conversations you, you know you always kind of have to play like devil's advocate just to like sure. tease out you know interesting interesting conversations so sure. I have to play the role of bad guy sometimes but um, I guess I guess maybe I wanted to like find out from you you know going forward you know what I guess first like what do you think the U.S. should do is, is there really anything the U.S. can do at this point to just you know improve contribute to improving the lives of the average uh, citizen, the average villager, uh, is, is, you know, what, what, if anything, can the U.S. do? Well, everybody wants this commission of inquiry um, that you were talking yeah. about, right? Everybody wants the United Nations to start a commission of inquiry, which is the first step toward, you know, getting these hearings on war crimes and things like that. Could be a first step to getting peacekeepers on the ground, which is a thing that people in Burma would be very, very happy about. You know, not all countries are pumped about UN soldiers coming into their country. This is actually an example of a place that desperately wants that. If you ever go to Burma and talk to people, every single person that you talk to will tell you that they're just waiting for the United yeah. States to invade and save them, which, you know, is never going to happen. But the Commission of Inquiry, besides being the responsibility of the United Nations, because there are war crimes and ethnic cleansing present, right. um, could, you know, could be a step forward. But you're right, China, you know, could probably yeah. block that forever, and it probably will. I think that the policy of sanctions that we've been pursuing since the 90s um, has been shown to be completely ineffective. You know, the mm -hmm. Congressional Research Serv Service just came out with another report a couple months ago which, you know, they do all the time saying, well, it looks like we don't actually have any evidence that these are being effective over there. And the State Department has released reports saying that when we pass those sanctions, what happens is that a bunch of garment factories got shut down and a bunch of people ended up in sex work when they weren't before. So mm -hmm. it's not a thing that is useful. And when I, you know, when my when my book about Burma came out in uh, in the spring, when I was touring, there were... Burmese people at my lectures sometimes, and they would always say, you know, since we, since you guys passed those sanctions in the 90s, all we've seen is the country get poorer and poorer. And as I said, you know, the more money we take out, the more money China puts in. So if we want to establish any kind of relationship where we have any kind of leverage, eliminating those kinds of relationships is not the answer. So that's, but I guess that seems to be two contradictory sort of ideas on the one hand push for um you know war crimes uh on the you know which which on in while with the other hand you're sort of you know encouraging investment in the country right well, it seems like it, yeah i mean it, they seem to be sort of you know it's a carrot and a stick at, at sort of the same time <laughs> Um, I mean, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right now, right? Right now, we're doing a carrot and a stick. We're like, we have sanctions, but you guys, we should totally be friends. And that, mm -hmm. you know, let's be friends sort of thing is only like a language diplomacy. You know, we'll come visit you sometimes. Think, um, I don't know. First of all, you know, if China is going to keep standing in the way of this commission of inquiry, yeah. it's possible that it is not going to go forward. Um, but I don't. I, I do agree with you that it, it may sound contradictory, but I don't know that those things actually have to be mutually yeah. exclusive. Our policy right now is is actually described as both carrot and stick. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's almost it's worth pointing out that you know there is sort of historical precedent for China not um, vetoing or China you know abstaining from measures to support a, a commission of inquiry in 2005 in in uh, Sudan. 
the Chinese abstained from a resolution that approved a commission of inquiry into uh, war crimes in, in Darfur. That commission of inquiry, you know, came back to the Security Council with a report saying, you know, there was war crimes in Darfur. What should we do about it? And, and the commission of inquiry recommended uh, that the International Criminal Court take up the case. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Chinese, once again, and, and the U.S. also abstained from a resolution letting the International Criminal or giving the International Criminal Court jurisdiction to uh, to launch an investigation in Darfur. And, you know, that eventually led to the indictment of the uh, head of state of Sudan. So, you know, it can happen. Um, it's, sure. it's sort of uh, the, the sort of international and diplomatic stars kind of need to align. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, part of the... Happen. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. No, it's not. And I mean, part of the reason why a lot of people think that happened is, you know, it would be just really bad publicity for you to try to block a commission of inquiry for a country that everybody knows is doing something really, really bad. Everybody knew that, mm -hmm. you know, Sudan was doing something really, really bad. And so part of mm -hmm. one of the complaints that a lot of activists around Burma make is that the UN resolutions are not strong enough. The, the ones against Burma say, you know, they're like a threat to national security. Okay, whatever. But if you put genocide in there, nobody wants to be the country that says, um, we suspect that there's a genocide going on there, but we don't think that anyone should investigate it. So if those resolutions would contain stronger language that describe what's actually going on and people actually knew what was going on and there was a sort of huge, you know, publicity campaign like there was about Sudan, then it would be harder for China to keep blocking those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so genocide, I mean, that, that's, that's, that, is, is that what you think is happening that's or right, has I, happened? That's right. I said that. You did. Um, I did. Yeah. I went there. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, it's not, you know, not just me personally. There are definitions mm -hmm. of genocide that are totally clearly laid out um, in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the UN language. Genocide and, convention, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And uh, if yeah. you go, there's like a checklist, right? Like, do you have this in place or this in place or this in place? And actually yeah. in, the, in, in the article that, you know, we ran in Mother Jones that, you know, went along with when, you know, my book came out was sort of explaining why it fits the checklist. And there's ton, right. there's a ton, there's a ton of like, evidence that supports, the hardest, that supports like, that. The, the hardest, I guess, I guess, you know, legal barrier is, is the intent question. Like, to commit genocide, you don't just need to kill a lot of people. You need to sort of kill them with the intent of wiping out a, a certain population. And, and like, you found sort of evidence of, of that sort of intent? Sure. Well, the, you know, the um, intent to destroy... The language in the Genocide Convention is actually to destroy um, in total or it, in part... Yeah. Right. So it doesn't have to be every single last person right. that, you right. know, the government is is aiming for. But if in whole or in part, uh, right. certainly. Absolutely. I mean, there you know, when government soldiers go into these villages, which they decide to go into based on the ethnicity of these people, they will leave mm -hmm. messages for them that, you know, say things like we're waiting for the day when all of your race will die. So, I mean, well, that's pretty, intent right there. So, yeah. Yeah. You would think that that yeah. chalk, chalked up on enough walls by government soldiers would be, you know, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's pictures of it. There's video of it. Like I said, I mean, there's like there's a crazy amount of evidence that's mounting. It's just it, you know, Burma hasn't got its big publicity campaign in the way that uh, Sudan did yet. And when it right. does, there's a lot of very horrifying stuff that people are ready to show. Um, so I, I guess before we, we turn on to our next like cheery topic, um, any, any sort of parting, parting thoughts? Oh, I have a parting thoughts. You should check out your book. I um, should check out my which, book? Well, well, you, like the, the viewing audience should check out the book and it's, it's next on my list. I just got myself a, a Kindle and I'm tearing through books these days and sort of once I, once I finish this Keith Richards, uh, autobiography. Uh, you're up Excellent. for sure. Excellent. Awesome. Sounds so, like a and good we'll, post, mix. we'll post a link to. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's a good lead-in. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll post a link to it too, and, and people should check it out. Um, so, another place from which you've uh, from which you've reported, Haiti, uh, also in the news this week for you know again 
not so cheerful reasons. Um, you know, it, you know, it seems as if you know Haiti really can't can't catch a break um, after there's the, the cholera epidemic, which uh, as of today we're recording this on Tuesday. Uh, the latest report from uh, OCHA, the, the UN humanitarian organization, said something like 544 people were killed mm -hmm. and something like 8,000 uh, have been hospitalized so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, over the weekend, Hurricane Thomas ravaged the country. Um, and, you know, that was kind of like the hurricane was always sort of people's greatest, deepest fears after um, the, the earthquake, it seemed. At least talking to people in, in, in the humanitarian community, you know, in 2008, Haiti got battered by back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back hurricanes. And that was before, you know, there, there were, you know, 1.3 million people living in tents. So uh, everyone was, was so, you know, on edge and, and so nervous and, and worried about this kind of nightmare scenario of a hurricane. And then we're so late in the hurricane season. It's like frickin' mid early November, and Haiti sort of seemed to avoid getting hit, and then all of a sudden, Hurricane Thomas made landfall. So it's it's sort of grim from there. But I don't know what what have like you heard from the fallout of of, of the uh, of the hurricane. Well, the news is that it's actually not anywhere near as bad as everyone had feared. You're right. People have been talking about yeah. that for months, right? They're like, oh, my God, it's hurricane season. What is going to happen during hurricane season? And when you go yeah. and you you know visit the tent cities, you can see why. I mean, they're not – tents is – um is like a really kind way of describing it. They are not tents. Mm -hmm. They are actually pieces of plastic that are held up by sticks. And so when I was there – it rained for 10 minutes, honestly, 10 minutes on a Friday night. And uh, yeah. because of that 10 minute rain shower, five people died because these, these, you know, settlements that have these quote unquote tents in them are so, I mean, they're so prone to flooding. They're prone to mudslides. These people have like absolutely no protection. So yeah, when I heard that there was a hurricane coming, you know, if a 10 minute rain shower killed five people, you could imagine what a serious storm would do. Luckily, you know, most of those tents are centered in and around Port-au-Prince directly. And Port-au-Prince was actually not hit that bad. It just, like, rained. It was kind of a crappy day. You know, it was gray and drizzly. A lot of people lost power. Um, there was, you know, it's not like there were no casualties. They're reporting now that 20 people died. And there are some people yeah. missing. But 20... Yeah. Even though, you know, is 20 too many, because um, if yeah. these people had shelter, you know, that wouldn't have happened, that still is way better than what mm -hmm. people were thinking. So, I mean, that's, that's I guess that's some good news with the bad news. As yeah, as I mean, I was, I was reading some reports in, in the news and, and sort of from, from humanitarian organizations, and, you know, they, they, they kind of, they credit um, Praval, the, the president, for, for you know, and, and the government in general, this is sort of a rare sign of, of, of Haitian government leadership sort of working out. And also, you know, you wonder how much of that is the humanitarian communities in the U.N. wanting to sort of put a good face on, on the Haitian government because everyone's sort of invested in them to sort of, you know, take, take charge at some point. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you said, it, it, it sort of, it, it, it worked and they, you know, had been kind of preparing for this uh, for, for the week before the storm hit. They kind of knew it was coming. There was some evacuations and there were pre-positioning supplies and, and all that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, like you, I was watching with, with trepidation, but it, it seemed to be not quite as bad as, as everyone had feared. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, speaking of devil's advocates, you know, that saying that those preparations that they were making, that the government did a really good job, I don't think that that is why it was okay. I think it was okay because it didn't really rain that hard. Like, you know, the preparations that they were making involved, to a large part, the government saying, you guys should leave. And yeah. there was no place any of those people could go. So mm -hmm. they didn't. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, if there had yeah. been some crazy storm, that would have been a very, very, I mean, it's sort of like, oh, nothing happened. Let's say that the government did a really good job of, of taking care of this. And really, I feel like that is more um, the result of the weather than of anything amazing yeah. that the government did. Because there were people, the people in the camps were like, they keep telling us to leave, but they haven't told us where to go. So, you know, <laughs> I guess we're just going to stay here. So yeah. I don't know how I don't know how useful the Haitians really felt the government was being for them at that mm -hmm. time. 
Well, you know, I would read these kind of periodic updates from, from OCHA, the, the UN Humanitarian Organization, which kind of collect information from different uh, NGOs and, and other sort of agencies about sort of the, what preparations were being made in there. They were like, you know, we've distributed 100,000 ropes to tighten down the plastic sheets and we pre-positioned water supplies and all that. So, you know, I got the sense at least that sort of things were, were happening. But, That's right. you know, on, on top of this is, uh, you know, the, the, the cholera epidemic, which is just, you know, again, like one of those things where it's like, can't Haiti just, just catch a break? Um, yeah. and, uh, it's, it's, uh, apparently spreading, you know, that, that's, you know, cholera is a waterborne disease, uh, heavy rains, um, you know, don't help contain the disease at least. And I'm wondering sort of what you're, you know, what, what, what are you hearing from, from your friends, your sources about sort of, you know, what's going on? Well, you know, the, the news is now what everyone has feared, which is that they've confirmed that cholera has made it to Port-au-Prince, which is what everybody yeah. did Everybody did not want. Before, there were some cases. There had been some cases originally, but all those people had come from the rural areas of Haiti where, you know, it had originally started. And so that wasn't the same thing as it, like, being in the capital. It, was, it had just, like, moved to the capital, right? So people were going back and forth yeah. and bringing it in, but that was the extent of that. Now they've confirmed that there was a three-year-old in one of the ten cities who had cholera and had not ever had not traveled within the last year and so hadn't picked it up anywhere else hadn't had any contact as far as anyone knew with any of those people and so now they're saying okay it's official it's in the capital which is what mm -hmm. everyone's sort of nightmare scenario was because right there's more than a million people who live in these cities you know these these like shanty towns that you know they live under plastic and there's no plumbing in them you know there's like, there's not water in a lot of them yeah. and uh and there's there certainly is no no sanitation so yeah aid right. groups are scrambling and trying to get people soap and things like that but um i mean that could be if that if that continues to spread within those 10 cities it will be i mean with the with how congested it is with that population density it's going to be like impossible to stop yeah, it's, it's so, I mean, everyone's kind of hold, holding their breath right now, but um, I actually wanted to turn to something that we talked about discussing before, which is an article you're working on about um, a rape crisis that, that's ongoing in, in many of these displacement camps. Um, you know, I've, I've read reports and, and warnings from groups like Refugees International put out a good report uh, a couple weeks ago about sort of what's going on and how, frankly, you know, you're talking about the, the, the problems of getting sanitation and, and basic, you know, uh, you know meet, meeting other basic needs in these camps. It seems one of the greatest problems is sort of a lack of any sort of law enforcement or, or, or law and order. Um, and I just want to, you know, turn it to you to, to sort of see what, what, you know, what can, you can tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, first, the first time that I went into one of the camps actually it was nighttime. It wasn't like super, it was like 6.30 or something like that, but it was dark outside and my translator did not want to drop me off and then he wouldn't come in with me. <laughs> he was like, it's dark outside and I'm Haitian and I'm black, but there's no way I'm going in there. I was like, okay, so there's no lights in 99% um, of these settlements. So once it's dark, it is dark. And there's just a ton of people like teeming in this small space. You know, it's very tense because people are very hungry and it is incredibly hot and there's no security. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty much, you know, it's as plain as that there's no security. There actually, when I was walking through the camp, this guy came running up to me and the guy who I was with who lived there, and he was saying, these guys are saying that they're going to burn down, you know, my little tent space because they want it for their own, you know, like, what can I, who can I call? Like, what can I do? And was sort of running around looking for people. And if you talk to, especially, especially in terms of um, the, the rape problem, to put it very mildly, that they're having, you know, all the women know that talking to the police is not going to be useful. They're not going to help them and they're not going to care. And there are some activists who've moved into, you know, Haitian activists who have moved into the camps and who are trying to provide sort of support and outreach 
for women who have been victimized so that they have somewhere to go and those activists are having to be moved around all the time because they're getting death threats and I talked to this one activist the day that she had to move out because some guy said that he was going to shoot her for trying to help rape victims and I said well did you go to the police and tell them that this guy was going to shoot you and she said yeah you know we went to the police but um, he said that he thought that the guy who was threatening us should have just killed us all because it's not a thing that people take seriously as a crime. It wasn't punishable by prison time until 2005. And so there's, I mean, it's sort of just a thing that happens, you know, like they had, a, it was a big problem before in Haiti. You know, there were, like there's this study from 2006 that there were 50 rapes happening in Port-au-Prince a day, and that was just based on reported numbers and just in that one city. And now there's, you know, there's no security and it's just like a total free-for-all and it's way, way worse. And so it's not a thing that unfortunately law enforcement takes seriously. So when that sort of thing does happen, there's nowhere that you can go. Besides that people who live in those cities, you know, are sort of like the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. And so they're not like, they're, you know, they're never a huge concern. It's funny when you were asking me like, what are you hearing from people? about this cholera thing and I'm hearing two totally different things like one from people who live in camps who are saying that they're terrified and then another from people who you know are pretty well to do and don't live in camps and they're like I don't know why everybody's freaking out about this cholera thing like we've, we've just been washing our hands you know there's sort of like there's sort of two worlds in, in every country but in Haiti the, the difference is I mean it's so vast it's like two completely different planets yeah you know I I um I have read, read reports about, you know, women being forced to, you know, like barter sex for food, if, if you can even use the term barter, or, or even yeah. worse, um, you know, like landowners are, are starting to sort of exercise their rights or, or their, their claims over lands that are used to house, you know, tens of thousands of people and are sort of forcing people off out of the camps that they've already been in. And it just seems like, you know, just such, such a mess. And, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hard for me to judge, you know, sitting here in D.C., but it doesn't seem as if the situation's getting terribly unstuck. At least if you look at sort of funding, like international funding for Haiti reconstruction, seems to be pretty much stalled at this point. Um, the U.S. funding has even been held up incredibly um, in, in Congress because of these sort of Byzantine congressional rules. But the, the bottom line is sort of the money for sort of that long term, not necessarily sort of the, the immediate relief, but sort of the long-term reconstruction, rebuilding, is 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 seemingly uh, sort of in, in in coming under hard times. So it's, yeah. it's uh it's rough. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the United States did send a billion dollars worth of emergency aid, right? Like U.S. Right. aid is there, and and that happened. We've got this other billion dollars for reconstruction, which, as you mentioned, is just kind of sitting around here and waiting to clear bureaucracy and stuff like that, which doesn't, I mean, you know, part of me when I'm in Haiti is like, how is this still looking like this? How is this actually getting worse? You know, it's been 10 months or whatever. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, I mean, that's no time. It seems like a long time yeah. when you live like terrified in a displacement camp every single day, right? In total yeah. squalor, but 10 months, I mean, you know, I was in New Orleans for four months covering the Gulf oil spill before I got to Haiti. And I was staying in a neighborhood that looked, you know, parts of that neighborhood looked like Katrina was five weeks ago. And that was five mm -hmm. years ago. And that's the United States. So, I mean, if you can, yeah, if you consider like the scope and, and just the amount of work that has to be done, it is, I mean, the amount of time that it's going to take is going to be staggering. And the people mm -hmm. in the displacement camps, um, at this point, are starting to accept that. I mean, they know it. They know that they're going to be there for a really long time. So uh, we're we're like at thirty seven minutes, but this has been great. Um, <laughs> is there any, like, is there anything else on your mind? I don't know. I, I, it's it's so hard to end these you know good conversations. <laughs> um, I, I think that I have probably said enough depressing things for one afternoon, right? Is that sort of the life of of a human rights reporter? It's it's got to be right. <laughs> Yeah, it can be. Although you know, there are, yeah. you know there are pockets, of course. Like, you know, I I just said, right. So I just said a bunch of like horrible things about Haiti in a row. Um, you know, on the other hand, I will say mm -hmm. that I met with some groups, for example, 
some incredibly tough, like, 40- and 50-year-old women who are running these anti-rape sort of, like, trying to help victims groups, and some of them have been shot. Yeah. They've all been threatened with their lives. They're all rape victims themselves, and they're like, we don't care. Like, we are going to keep working on this. So there are definitely some strong and not easily intimidated people on the ground who are busting serious ass to make it, you know, easier in the meantime, you know, to to live there. So there's my not my, there's my one not depressing thing. That See, I, I told you, I like to look on the bright side of things. So, so that's this is a great a great way to leave it. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure.